Like, all right, that's the way. He knows how it works. Now, I thought to myself, wait a minute, who, who would be some of the philosophers y'all would name? Socrates, who's probably most famous for his statement, the unexamined life is not worth living. That's a pretty st strong statement. The unexamined life is not worth living. He insisted that his fellow citizens in Athens examine their beliefs and values, their attitudes, their emotions. He insisted that they re-examine these things on a regular basis. And of course, they insisted he drink poison and die. Okay, but it didn't go too well. Nonetheless, one person who listened to him was his young student, Plato. Now, Plato, interestingly, said, you know what? In changing times, we need to latch on to unchanging principles. Plato believed that we could have success in this world only if we understand what never changes. Then we can bring our best to the things that do change. Now, he had a student as well named Aristotle who said, you know those things that we ought to bring to any changing situation? They are called virtues. And premier amongst the virtues is the quality of courage. Courage. Aristotle understood that only a virtuous person, only a courageous person, can experience what he said we all seek. And you know what that quality was? Happiness. Only a courageous, virtuous person can be happy. Now, I, I decided to bring you these pictures of Greek philosophers, but having taught at a Catholic university for all those years, I had to bring you one picture of a medieval Catholic philosopher, so I decided to bring you today William of Ockham, viewed from a great distance. <laughs> Appropriate because he was always in trouble, always having to leave town. William of Ockham is the first person to really say, keep it simple, stupid. In every situation, no matter how complicated, there's always a simple essence at, at its core. If we can master that simple essence we'll be able to master all the complications. Today we're going to look at the simple essence of how to deal with change. I mean, you all are living through a very interesting time in your lives right now. We're going to talk about, well, let me, let me, let me bring you to the time I was first introduced to philosophy in an academic context. My first day of school, first grade, Ms. Anders' class, Durham, North Carolina, 1958. Now this was at a time where you didn't go to preschool. I didn't know anybody who had been to kindergarten. This was my first day in an academic classroom. The first time I walked through the doors of a classroom not knowing that that was going to be the first of hundreds and thousands of times over many, many years to come that I would walk into a classroom. Let me, let me give you a sense of what the period of time I'm talking about, 1958. Nikita Khrushchev becomes premier of the Soviet Union. Elvis Presley joins the army. Jerry Lee Lewis marries his very, very young cousin. And Con Connie Francis has a hit with the song, Who's Sorry Now? An interesting time in history, an interesting time in my life. Miss Anders was a beautiful teacher. She had this kind of Jackie Kennedy thing going on, you know? As she stood in front of the classroom, all of a sudden, I felt within myself, I didn't understand it at the time, but I felt within myself kind of a Jack Kennedy thing sort of going on all of a sudden, and I didn't know what this meant. She stood in front of the classroom and greeted the class graciously and then wrote a sentence on the board. We had no idea why. None of us could read. <laughs> but then she read it out loud. And I remember to this day what it said. Now, I, you know, C. Spot. I, well, where did Spot run? I have no idea to this day. Who, who were Dick and Jane? I have no clue. But this sentence has stuck with me, not just in the bottom of my mind, but the top of my mind, all these years. She wrote across the board the sentence, Life is not what you want it to be. It is what you make it. Now talk about hitting a bunch of six-year-olds with an existential brick. I mean, that's pretty, that's pretty heavy, isn't it? Life is not what you want it to be. It is what you make it. I mean, that was haunting. Something bothered me that first day about, well, why isn't it what you want it to be? You know, but it was, there was deep wisdom there. In fact, Ms. Anders was doing philosophy my first day of school. 
Now, you know the word philosophy comes from two Greek root words, philo, love of, Sophia, wisdom. Think about this for a second. An object of love. When you lack it, you pursue it. When you have it, you embrace it. Philosophy is just the pursuit and embracing of wisdom. Wisdom for living. Today, we're going to ask a question. We're going to ask the question, what wisdom do we have about change and about dealing with change? I mean, I, I, I'm so glad uh, I was asked to be with you all today because I've been reading about this for, for decades and I never pulled it all together. And, 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 and this has given me the opportunity to come and renew and refresh my perspective on what all the greatest philosophers, what all the wisest people through history have said about change. I mean, think for a second. Heraclitus, everything is always changing. Change is persistent, the pre-Socratic philosopher. Everything is always changing, whether we realize it or not. Number two, change is necessary. Emperor Marcus Aurelius, the great Stoic philosopher, said nothing good ever happens without a change. In the uh, glass cases over there, you have a, 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 an amazing collection of books. I looked through them right before the session. You have two copies of Marcus Aurelius's meditations in that bookcase. Some of the wisest advice ever given to human beings about life. Incredible. Number three, change is often scary. Well, wait a minute, it's persistent. Usually we're not scared by persistent things, things all around us, things going on everywhere. We're, 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 we're afraid of the new thing, the unknown thing, the thing that we've never come across. If change is necessary, who gets scared of necessary things? I mean, necessary things we usually just kind of accept. Okay, that's the way it is. But change is very scary. Why? Why? I mean, think for a second. Just think of the word change. How do we use this? How do we come across it? All right, let me give you an example. Uh, let me take you back a few days. I'm in my yard uh, cleaning up after Hurricane Ophelia. Okay, this, this was not supposed to come near my house, but at the last minute, there was a change, of course, of the hurricane. It come right to my front door like seven hurricanes before it in the last 10 years. You all know anything about the other Wilmington, which I've almost come to believe is the wrong Wilmington. Wilmington, North Carolina, in 10 years that I've lived there, we've had eight hurricanes through my front yard every time. It's, it's unbelievable. I mean... I started to wonder now, 10 years ago when I was thinking about buying a house down there, it never occurred to me to ask, why is the river near my house named the Cape Fear River? <laughs> it never occurred to me to ask why my neighborhood was called Landfall. <laughs> now I know. Okay, all day long I'm working, cleaning up after the hurricane. I'm tired, I'm hot, I've gotten a lot accomplished, I've got the whole evening free. I said, great, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to go in and read a book I've been wanting to read for a long time. I'm just going to take the evening off and read the book. And so, and so I go in the house, and I'm a mess. I'm dirty, so, so I've got to you know, change clothes, right? And, 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 and then I go sit in my favorite chair, and I turn on the lamp, and I grab the book. It's, it's the new translation of Don Quixote, 900-some pages. I've been wanting to read. I turn on it. Nothing, nothing happened. The bulb is burnt out. I've got to change the bulb, right? And I look around. We don't have the 60 watt or three watt, different kinds of whatever it is. So I've got to go to the grocery store. So I rush to the grocery store. I go into the Harris Teeter grocery store. Nothing is the, last, the way I last saw it. They have undergone a major change and they've rearranged everything in the store and I can't find it. So I'm up and down the aisles, up and down the aisles. Finally, I get to the bulb. I get to the cash register. I, I'm eager to get home and start this book. The lady in front of me has got like $50 worth of groceries that she's trying to buy with loose change in her purse. And, and I'm standing there forever. My hair's falling out. Finally, I get out of there, get in the car, put a key in the ignition and the light comes on that says change oil. I says, okay, later. I drive home. It's a mile. I pick up a roofing nail. I get a flat tire and I have to change my tire. I run into the house. My daughter hands me her daughter, 16-month-old uh, uh, Gracie. says, Dad, could you change the baby? I'm in the middle of something. I've got to change a diaper before I can even... And then at that point, I realize... I'm too tired for this. I'm not going to be able to take on a 900-page book. There's going to be a change of plans because we didn't get enough sleep last night. My wife wakes up every hour and wakes me up with hot flashes because she's going through the change. I mean, uh, you see what I'm saying? <clears throat> it's not a pretty picture. 
Now, no wonder, right? No wonder. Now, remember, remember that great uh, <coughs> former Notre Dame football coach and Catholic philosopher Lou Holtz, who was often asked, why don't you throw the ball more often? Do you remember what he used to say? He's famous for his little quips at press conferences. He used to say, when you throw the ball, only three things can happen. Two of them bad. I don't like the odds. Okay, for those of you who are not football uh, uh, fans, aficionados, three things can happen. What did he mean? Well, first of all, there can be an incomplete pass. The receiver drops the ball. Well, that's, very, that's bad, right? I mean, that's a bad uh, outcome. But what's the second thing? There can be an interception. Somebody catches the ball, but it's the wrong person on the other team. That's very bad. And th third possibility, there's a completion. Okay, not bad, unless it's for a net loss of yards, in which case, well, you, you get the, the picture. It's not the, I don't like the odds, he said. A lot of people approach change the very same way. When there's a change, three things can happen, two of them bad. People say, I don't like the odds. Well, what's the parallel here? Well, first of all, it can, let's get it out of the way. It can be a change for the better. Okay, good. Number two, it can be a change for the worse, bad. Number three, it can be a change that doesn't really make things either better or worse, also bad, because why did we go to all the trouble, right? So a lot of people look at that, only three things can happen, two of them bad. I don't like the odds. Well, now, the wise view of change is this. The odds aren't unchangeable. You can change the odds. Whenever Lou Holtz lost a football game during his years at Notre Dame, you know what the other team tended to be a team that did? They tended to be a team that passed the ball. Do you all remember the Notre Dame-Miami years where every year it was like, who's going to win the national championship? It was the team that passed the ball. But what about his only three things can happen to two of them bad? I don't like the odds. What about that? The odds are never unchangeable. You can change the odds. Now, there is an art of change I wanted to bring to you all today. It is composed of some component arts. It involves three, as a matter of fact. The art of self-control, the art of positive action, and the art of achievement. Now, let's just take a minute and go through each of these because they're very, very, very important. Um, number one, the art of self-control. Don't rush to judgment. Never rush to, to judgment. The great philosophers, in fact, the philosophers known as skeptic philosophers, they were the first to start saying, never rush to judgment. Uh, number two, value the right things. Number three, use your imagination well. Okay, let's, let's unpack these for just a second. Don't rush to judgment. You know what the Stoic philosophers like to say? In this world, they like to say nothing's as good as it seems or as bad as it seems, so we should all just calm down. I mean, don't, don't you see people all around you getting really excited about something? This is great, this is great. It ends up being okay, but not nearly what they thought. Or this is terrible, this is horrible, I can't believe it. And it ends up being, you know, manageable. I mean, I, I was 42 years old. When my dentist said for the first time, we've got to take out your wisdom teeth. I mean, and, and for, I'd say, wait a minute, for a philosopher, that's kind of bad for business. Wisdom teeth? I mean, you know, yeah. <clears throat> they said, no, everybody should have them out. And I said, no, 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 no. I have a personal policy. Never lose body parts without a good reason. I said, why do you want that? Well, we have to because they're turning all kinds of weird angles and stuff. And, oh, we've got to tell you this. Here, sign these forms about the anesthesia. And, you know, all the forms, they're all about you know, death. All the forms are uh, about you know, the uh, chance, uh, remote chance of death in this procedure. And I remember for weeks going up to my wisdom tooth extraction, I had all these worst case scenarios running through my head. I was so worried. I was, this is going to be horrible. This is going to be terrible. I mean, I'm, I'm you know, cut short in the prime of life. And, 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 and because of the pharmaceuticals employed that day, I had the best time I've ever had in a dentist's office. <laughs> Things are, so be, don't rush to judgment. Number two, expecting the worst isn't a sign of realism. 
but of self-defeating pe pessimism. Um, there's a book called Learned Optimism. You know, the psychologist Seligman, he, he studied the way pessimistic attitudes and optimistic attitudes affect outcomes. Now, it, 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 there's a funny thing about the predictive ability, respectively, of optimism and pessimism. They tend to be self-fulfilling in bizarre ways. Pessimists actually limit their use of their own resources. Optimists empower themselves. And a, and a lot of pessimists think they're just being hard-headed, they're just being tough-minded, they're just being real. No, no, no. They're, they're being self-defeating. You know what? A, a true realist can be an optimist by being an activist. By taking it. Life is not what you want it to be, it's what you make it. By being an activist. Look, this is pretty interesting, but the second thing is equally interesting. In the art of self-control, the second thing is to value the right things. We, we, we tend to value comfort and security far too highly in our culture right now. Far too highly. Anything wrong with comfort? Anything wrong with security intrinsically? No. We tend to value them far too highly. We don't value enough, and we should value growth and learning. Growth and learning. If we valued that more, we'd pay our teachers a lot more, for example, including our philosophy professors. But I mean, elementary, Ms. Andrews should have been paid more. Our teachers should have, growth and learning. We're all in this world to live a series of adventures. You know what I've learned as a philosopher? The only true security, the only true comfort, is you living your proper adventure. And adventure inherently involves the unknown. It inherently involves change and challenge and opportunity. Comfort and security come out as side benefits, as byproducts of living your proper adventure and not focusing first and foremost on those two things. When people focus on the first two, they sacrifice the second two. It's really pretty interesting. Now, those of you who have heard me talk about true success, and, and we did this a few years ago, you may remember a, a PowerPoint slide. Some of the greatest advice on ongoing success in life, the philosopher said, do not allow what is very good to keep you from what is best. And remember I told a story. I said, suppose you're out in the woods uh, on a hike, and you're, you're, let's, let's make it even more interesting. You're leading a group of other people. And let's say you said it is your goal to get to the highest point in the area from which you'll be able to survey all the surrounding terrain, and from where you stand, it looks like hill A is the highest point. You want to get to the highest point, it looks like it's hill A. You struggle, uh, you climb, you pull each other up the side of hill A, you slip and fall, you finally get to the summit, from which vantage point you can now see for the first time the much higher hill B. Now, if your goal is to get to the highest point in the area and you now stand perched atop hill A, what's the first thing you're going to have to do to attain your true goal? Anybody? Go downhill. And what's everybody going to say when you suggest this? What do you mean we have to go downhill? This is very good. It took us a, lot, a long time to get up here. We can see a lot from Hill A. There are so many people right now, there are so many businesses stuck on Hill A because nobody wants to go downhill. What does that metaphorically represent? Changing what you've most recently been doing. The great philosopher said, do not allow what is very good to keep you from what is best. You get to Hill A, use it as your base camp for your next ascent up the next highest hill. Life is supposed to be a series of ascents, a series of adventures. I was, y'all know, some of y'all know my adventure. I, I, as Michelle said, I taught Notre Dame for 15 years. I was the first professor ever to leave the philosophy department, not to go to a, univer, a different university, but just to, to quit, just to go do something different. I was the first one. And they said, people said, are you crazy? This is the one place in the economy where you have a guaranteed job for the rest of your life. You can't give up the security. You can't give up your kids' college educations paid for. You can't. And then one of my neighbors, I remember him standing there and saying, wait a minute, how many, how many, how many days a week do you work? I said, well, I work Monday and Wednesday. And he said, well, what, what do you mean? When do you teach on Monday and Wednesday? And I said, well, I teach an hour in the morning, an hour in the, after in the afternoon. You get a full salary for working one hour in the morning, one hour in the afternoon, two days a week? I said, yeah. He said, uh, do you grade all the students' papers? Because he knew I had huge classes. I said, no, I got, I got 12 teaching assistants to do that. You're going to leave this job. You go to work two hours a day, two days a week. You don't even grade papers. You're going to leave that. And then he said, how are you going to know the difference? I mean, you know. It's not... All right. 
But you know what, y'all? I had a couple of sleepless nights. I just decided it was time for a new adventure. I love Notre Dame. It had been very good to me. But I said, you know what? I'm being prepared for something else. I don't know what it is. That's the, that's the wild thing about adventures in this life. Every adventure you're on prepares you for the next one in ways sometimes you have no clue about. But it always does. Now, it's important. Number three. Use your imagination well. That's the third component of the art of self-control. And even the little two hills, if you can use that in your imagination to conceptualize a situation, it can powerfully switch the framing you have around the circumstances, the mental framework through which you view it. Understand the role of imagination in your beliefs, emotions, and attitudes. Blaise Pascal in the 17th century, great scientist and mathematician, a lot of you have read Pascal and you know, decision theory, probability theory, uh, pneumatics, hydraulics. He, he was a great scientist. And, 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 and Pascal understood that the imagination is probably the most important power in human life. Isn't that interesting? Take control of this vital power. Block negative images. Boost positive in it, images. When I wrote a book on the stoic art of living two years ago, I had, I had studied Seneca, a first century lawyer, Marcus Aurelius, emperor of Rome, and Epictetus, who was a slave. The three levels of society in ancient Rome, and they spoke with one voice. In fact, the emperor learned his philosophy from the slave. Uh, Epictetus, Seneca, Marcus Aurelius. They said, don't let your, catch your imagination. Take control of it before it takes control of you. Because that's the game that happens in this world. I mean, have y'all ever had an experience like this? I, 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 my, my wife wanted me to get a gas grill. I'd never had a gas grill. And, and so she, for Father's Day, she calls Sears because they'll, I can't put anything together. Yeah, I'm a philosopher, for crying out loud. Abstract ideas. You know, I can't put things together. And so she calls Sears, can you put it together, deliver it, set it up for him? And they said yes, because she knew, you know, a gas grill can be dangerous, so I'm not really to be trusted except to, you know, put the burgers on it. And so they come. The Sears truck come. It's all put together. They set it up in the back, and I'm out there watching, you know, like a little kid. And they say, well, look, we're not allowed to hook up the propane tank. You have to do that yourself. I said, okay, I figure one thing I can do. And, but then I remembered I'd read all these articles about the dangers of propane. You know, that propane can be very, very, you know, there are all these gases. There's radon and there's propane. And, and propane, it's everywhere, but it's dangerous for crying out loud. I read these articles about asphyxiation and all this stuff. And, you know, I'm putting it together. I'm all thumbs when it comes to I'm putting it together and, and I'm, I smell something funny and, and I'm starting to get a little woozy, a little dizzy. And so I go over here, I run across, my wife is seeing me run across the backyard. <sighs> take some deep breaths, I go back over, I hold my breath while I'm using the wrenches and the screws and, everything, and then I run over again, I must have done this six or seven times to get some fresh air I'm getting sick, I'm getting nauseous I mean, I'm getting woozy and, and nauseous and, and finally I just said I can't do this anymore I gotta call the Sears guy, I call the Sears guy I said listen, I'm breathing all this I'm trying to put together the propane, I'm breathing all this stuff and what can I do and he said well what are you breathing, I said well the, the propane, he said well where did you get the propane I said you guys brought the propane. He said, no, sir, we delivered an empty tank. <laughs> I was being asphyxiated on a gas that did not exist. <laughs> that is the power of the imagination. Do not doubt it for a second. Take control of this power. Block negative images. Encourage positive images. Images. Oh, what does that mean? I'm supposed to self-hypnotize, self be self-delusional? No, you're supposed to be self-empowering. Because guess what? You wouldn't be where you are right now unless you had an amazing array of skills, knowledge, abilities, and powers. The key to success in any set of challenging circumstances is liberating those powers and skills and knowledges you already have so that you can actually access them and use them. I've known people who've frozen up in, in uh, crisis situations and they could not access the power they had, even the power to move, the power to get out of the way of something. Use your imagination well. The imagination can shut you down or it can empower you. I had a Notre Dame football player, 300 pounds, come into my office shaking like a leaf the night before his first exam. He said, Professor, I'm scared to death about the exam. And I said, really? I said, well, do you ever get nervous before games? He said, all the time. And I said, well, does that ever stop? He said, yeah, as soon as I take the first hit, I'm fine after that. And I said, well, you know what? The people who never get nervous, who never get worried, are usually the people who never accomplish anything. 
I, I, I went in the philosophy department one day and I said to a, a, another pr professor, oh God, I was so nervous before class today because I was trying out something new and either it would work and be great and they would re re remember it for 20 years or I'd fall on my face. And I said, boy, I was so nervous. Do you get nervous before classes? And he said, no. I, are you? He said, I never get nervous before class. I checked into, he had the lowest teaching evaluations in the history of the philosophy department. <laughs> you know what? I used to think to myself before a big event, oh, I'm feeling a little nervous. Now when I feel my heart rate go up, I just say, you know what? I'm ready. How do you use your imagination? How do you describe a situation to yourself? The greatest athletes I've ever known were people who had nervous energy that they surfed on. They didn't let it shut them down. They used it. The Stoic philosopher said that's always the way in life. Does it control you or do you control it? Control your imagination well. Well, the second main component art within the art of change is what I call the art of positive action. It involves three things. Number one, govern your attitudes. Number two, look for opportunities. Number three, take the initiative. One, one Renaissance philosopher once said, know yourself, know your strengths, know your weaknesses, know your opportunities. Now, govern your attitudes. That has to do with what you're feeling on the inside. Know your opportunities. That has to do with what's going on on the outside. Take the initiative that connects the inner you with the outer circumstances. Take the initiative. You know the old saying, there are three kinds of people in the world? Those who make things happen, those who watch things happen, and those who go around saying, what happened? I mean, right? You ever be in the first category. Be in the first category. Take initiative. Uh, this depends, this all depends on self-knowledge. Remember Socrates in the unexamined life? What are my attitudes? You know, there's a weird thing about attitudes. We have them, but we don't tend to think about them. We view the world through them, but we need to step back and say, okay, is this a healthy attitude to have that I'm having right now, or is it counterproductive? Like Seligman with, with optimism and pessimism. What are my attitudes? Where are my opportunities? You know what? When we face times of change, a lot of us kind of narrow our focus. Whereas we should be broadening, okay, what are the opportunities for really me to make my impact in this new set of circumstances? How can I make my mark here? I mean, the great philosophers, you know, when Demosthenes, the great rhetorician, was asked what's the key to rhetorical success in public speaking, you know, he was the first person to ever repeat a phrase like this. He said, way before real estate people started doing this, he said, action, action, action. Ends up, that's the key to success as well. If I had to say one thing I've learned from the lives of successful people and philosophers who've reflected on those lives, it's the importance of taking initiative. Not being a passive perceiver of what's going on, but taking positive initiative in any set of situations. Now, here's an interesting thing. Whenever anything unwanted, unsought for, undesired happens in this world, the number one reaction in the world today is, is always the same. Look around cultures, world cultures. You know, I ask myself this, you know, maybe I was watching too much Oprah for a while. I don't know, but you know, Oprah's always talking about gratitude and being grateful. And I thought to myself, what's the number one emotion and attitude around the world these days? It sure didn't strike me that gratitude was it. Or joy. Like we're all joyful all over the world, in France, in Germany, in Saudi Arabia, everybody's joyful. No, I mean. Look around the world, when anything unwanted at all happens, the number one reaction tends to be anger, doesn't it? Number two is not far behind, anxiety. Anger and anxiety are two of the most pervasive human responses to the world. Isn't that something? Seneca thought this was so important, he wrote an entire thick book on anger because he thought it was one of the most self-defeating things in the world. Now, Aristotle said anger is not intrinsically bad. I mean, it all depends on uh, anger toward whom, for what reason, uh, in what measure, for how long, to what end. You know, he asked a lot of questions about it. Because sometimes you, you get, you know, righteous indignation. You could get angry at some injustice happening, and that goad you to action. Well, okay. 
But you know what the, the great philosophers of Rome had to say about this? They said, well, whenever unexpected change happens and it's even possible to doubt its value, anger and anxiety naturally arise. But they said, if it's something you can't control, acceptance is better than anger and anxiety. If it's something you can control, action is better. In fact, their overall claim is this. The key to inner resilience and outer results in this world is to accept what you can't control and take action on what you can control. I mean, the Stoics have taken me to school on this. I mean, they've really helped me to understand when we set goals, often we set goals in terms of things that are not up to us. It's just up to other people, you know. We should, we should all, always be setting goals. Sure, it's okay to say to yourself, you know, if you're a movie director, I want to direct the number one box office hit of the year. That's an okay goal, but it's not totally in your control. What is in your control is to make the greatest possible movie about X, you know, or, or the, uh, uh, to use your actors as well as you possibly, to shoot in every part. You know, learn to set things that are in your control. Now, look at this. Acceptance and action. Acceptance. I decided as long as we're going to even mention that, I, I should bring you something else real quick because it's related. You know, there's a formula for happiness I mean, I've, I've been reading about happiness for a long time. I'm reading a book this week on happiness by a psychologist, or an, actually, he, he's mostly an economist in, in, in England. Uh, I think he's at London School of Economics. But I'm always reading books by philosophers, psychologists, uh, social theorists on happiness to try to understand people's different takes on this because I'm working on a long-term project on, on, on personal happiness. We have so many false beliefs about happiness. It's really amazing to me. And the wisest philosophers, if you dig deep enough, you can find some amazing stuff. And we have all these words, contentment, fulfillment, satisfaction, happiness, that we kind of toss around as if they all mean the same thing. Well, let me, let me precisify a few of these for you for a second. Let me, let me give you some definitions. Contentment equals emotional acceptance of the present. Now, here's a really important insight from philosophy. Contentment is not the same thing as complacency. Not the same thing. Contentment is just accepting the present. You're not balled up with negative emotions, resentment, bitterness, irritation, frustration. How did I get in this position? How, why could this be happening to me? You're not bundled, balled up in that at all. That ties people's hands behind their back. You, you know people who are all bundled up in negative emotions. They can't do anything positive. <sighs> Contentment is emotionally accepting the present as being what it is. That's very compatible with a strong desire to make the future very different. That's why it's not the same thing as complacency. Contentment is an acceptance of the present. Fulfillment is something very different. It's a progressive realization of your potential. See, contentment is a psychological thing. Subjective. Acceptance. Fulfillment is an objective thing. It's you progressively making your mark on this world. You progressively having your proper distinctive impact. There are no two identical people in this room. I've known identical twins who are not at all identical existentially. They had different life experiences. They had different desires. They have different attitudes. No two people are alike. You have a chance to make a difference in this world, not replicated by anybody else. Fulfillment is an experience of the progressive realization of your potential. All right, where is this going? I define satisfaction as contentment plus fulfillment. Deep satisfaction. Do you, do you live a satisfied life? Are you living a satisfied... Well, are you content? Are you fulfilled? Remember, content doesn't mean I'm not going to really work hard to make tomorrow different. Content just means, okay, I accept certain things as being what they are. And fulfillment, am I using my talents, my powers to their max for the good of other people as well as myself? Satisfaction is the coming together of those two things. We only got to add one more ingredient to the stew here. Enjoyment. I define as pleasure and love. Take pleasure in your work. Take pleasure in the little things in life. 
Any day you think you're having a bad day, there's so many. I had a professor. Okay, so when, so when you're 22, you don't understand this. I had a biblical study professor at Carolina uh, who ca would come into class. He was 59 years old. He would say, I woke up this morning, and there are, you know, 326 pain centers in my body, and I thought, not a single one of them is firing. I'm not in pain in any of those places. And I thought, that's an odd point of view. I'm 53, and I understand it's not so odd, you know. Uh, learn to appreciate the little things. Learn to take pleasure in the little thing. And love, never cut yourself off from love of family, love of friends, love of colleagues, love of a beautiful day, love of what you're doing. Pleasure is, a, is kind of a minor level thing. Love is much deeper, but they're both important because they're both part of enjoyment. Now, where, here we go. Da -da -da -da. We got our culmination here. Happiness is just satisfaction, plus enjoyment. Everybody got a little laminated wallet card today. On one side is the art of change. The other side, I've given you my little formula for your reflection and examination. Now, let me tell you how seriously to take this formula. I want you all to give this formula the due measure of its proper respect and honor. I made it up. I made it up. Just like Plato made stuff up, just like Aristotle made stuff up, just like William of Ockham. But you know what? In making it up, I'm doing the best I can to capture those realities in your life and in my life. Using the conceptual apparatus that we have to give us those coordinates on our map that we need. So I want you all to never hesitate to tell me if you have some interesting different thoughts about this or how you see it working. It's so important. But let me just give you number three real quick. The third main component, art within the art of change. Well, those of you who've heard me talk about true success, uh, here in, probably here in this very room a few years ago, if I remember correctly, for true success in times of change, we need seven things. We need a clear conception of what we want to see happen. We need a strong confidence in our prospects. We need a focused concentration on the path we're on. We need a stubborn consistency in what we do. And what I mean by that is not doing things the way we always did them in the past, but consistency with your highest goals and your deepest values. The Chinese have a great image for this. They say, be like water. Water comes, comes across an obstacle. What does it do? It goes around it, goes over it, goes under it, goes through it. It's an interesting thing. Be like water. Water, what's more powerful, water or stone? Stone is massive and it's heavy. It's water that's more powerful. Turn on the weather channel, right? You see it happening all the time. Water is much more powerful. Be like water. Be consistent with your nature, and you can make the most of any set of circumstances. Uh, we need an emotional commitment to the task at hand. We need a good character to guide us and keep us on proper course. We need a capacity to enjoy the process along the way. Amex was mentioned a few minutes ago. I have to share with you an email I got from a, an Amex. Uh, he's a... Uh, Heads up an office, he headed up an office in Orlando until recently. He heard me speak on these seven conditions of success. I call them the seven C's of success. And he wrote me an email uh, nine months later. He said, Tom, six months ago, we were ranked 200 and I think 69th in the country in productivity in, uh, within American Express Financial Advisors. I mean, that was bottom of the barrel. I didn't know they had that many offices in America. You know, he was pushing the limit there. And he said, We've, I've trained everybody in the office in the seven C's of success, as you call them, for six months. And we are now ranked 19th in the country in productivity six months later. People aren't, satisfying their uh, aren't sacrificing their family lives to just work extra hours. They're using the seven C's to be better at home as well as being better at work. He said, you're right, the wisdom of the great philosophers is so powerful in our lives if we'll just put it to work. This is the art of achievement that's part of the art of change. Now, think of these arts. Well, let me bring you a quote. It's not the strongest of the species that survives or the most intelligent, but the, most, the one most responsive to change. Isn't it interesting that, that Charles Darwin pointed to the ability to adopt, to adapt, to respond, to change. In this world of change, one thing that doesn't change 
is that you can find me anytime at this website. <laughs> and I want to tell you all something. I want you to write me through the website or at my personal email, which I think you all are the first group that I've ever put my personal email up on the screen for, but I believe in you all. I believe in what you're doing. And I believe that you can make some unbelievable things happen if you will use the wisdom of the great philosophers on change, if you will use the art of change. Let me, th let me know what you think about what, what we've talked about today. Let me know where the shoe is pinching the foot in your life. Let me know what, what you've seen work and what you want me to think about some more. Let me know what's on your mind. I think that in the next few months, in the coming years, y'all are going to be, because I've, I know a lot about y'all, y'all are going to be artists of change. And I'm going to see from y'all some great works of art. Thanks for having me to be your philosopher. Thank y'all a lot. Thanks.